Hello, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2024 annual lecture of the Yan P. Lin Center. Um, I'm Catherine Liu, the director of the center and a professor in political science. Welcome to uh, McGill University for this event. I'd like to acknowledge that McGill is located on Yotaga, Montreal uh, territory, which is uh, where we recognize and respect the Ganyan Gahaga as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet today. This place has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations, including the Ganyangahaga of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Anishinaabeg, as well as the Huron-Wendat and the Abenaki. The Yampi Lin Center for the Study of Freedom and Global Orders in the Ancient and Modern Worlds promotes research and discussion across disciplines, eras, and regions into social and political values, ideas, and transformations. It aims to support excellence in humanistic social inquiry with particular attention to fundamental questions and structures of social order at all levels, from global systems to domestic constitutional orders to the built environment of cities. Today, the center is greatly honored to welcome Professor Aisha Zerikol, whose work is so exemplary of the kind of cross-disciplinary, cross-era, cross-regional research uh, on social political ideas, orders, and transformations that the center actually seeks to encourage and promote. Professor Aisha Zerikol is Professor of International Relations at the University of Cambridge and a politics fellow at Emmanuel College. Uh, in 2023, she was awarded the Koch Medal of Science, the first one in international relations, that is given annually to one scholar of Turkish origin for outstanding global success and significant progress in their field. Professor Zorakol works on East-West relations in the international system, problems of modernity and sovereignty, rising and declining powers, and IR theory. Her first book, after Defeat, How the East Learned to Live with the West, published in 2011, deals with the problems of international stigmatization and the integration of defeated powers, uh, especially Turkey after World War I, Japan after World War II, and Russia after the Cold War. I would go back to visit that book. It was really enlightening and really showed, I think, very powerfully the concept of stigmatization and its problems in modern international order. She has, of course, published widely in journals such as the American Political Science Review, International Organization, and I should mention International Theory as well for various reasons, uh, as well as the European Journal of International Relations. And she's also edited and contributed to the award-winning Hierarchies in World Politics, an edited volume, including, I believe, uh, some of our local talent, uh, Vincent Pouliot uh, and others, a uh, very illuminating volume about hierarchies in, in world order. Her latest book, Before the West, The Rise and Fall of Eastern World Orders, was published in 2022 and advances a truly new history of Eurasian international relations, rethinking the concepts of order, sovereignty, and decline, as well as centralization and various other concepts related to political order. It has won many book awards, including the International Studies Association 2024 John Ruggie Annual Best Book Award, the Social Science and History Association's 2023 Charlin Memorial Award, the International Studies Northeast Association 2023 Yale Ferguson Award, uh, ISA's History Sections Award, as well as the Theory Sections Award, uh, and also an honorable mention with the International History and Politics Section, Jervis and Schroeder Award. Uh, so prize-winning a book that is very well deserved. And she is also currently the Associate Editor at International Organization. So today we are delighted to hear Professor, Professor Zerikol's lecture, Is the Disorder of Our Times Unprecedented? Please join me in welcoming Professor Aisha Zerikol to the Lynn Center at McGill. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to be here. Um, 
Uh, McGill is a setting I've visited um, not only professionally, but uh, because I went to university, as I was telling Catherine, in, uh, in Vermont, I went to Middlebury College. We used to come up to Montreal all the time and uh, also visit the McGill campus. So it's, it's always a treat to, um, to uh, come back uh, and talk to you about uh, my work. Um, now, today's uh, lecture uh, is called Is the Disorder of Our Times Unprecedented? Uh, I will give you my answer, but I, I, my main goal uh, is to um, maybe advance uh, a different way uh, we can think about uh, this question, uh, building on my both my historical and uh, theoretical work, including before the West, but some of the uh, things I've been thinking about uh, since the publication uh, of that book. Now, if you ask, uh, is the disorder of our times unprecedented, and you talk to more traditionally oriented IR scholars, they will say, no, we know what is happening. We know why there is so much uncertainty and volatility in the system. Uh, you know, this is return of great power politics. Uh, so Mearsheimer has been in the news a lot uh, since Russia's war on Ukraine. You know, he would have a particular reading of what is happening now that is, uh, you know, he wouldn't say this is not, none of what is happening now. He would, I think, I mean, not to put words in his mouth, but it's not unexpected. It's uh, quite explainable using, uh, uh, you know, realist approaches to international relations theory or, uh, you know, take something like power transition theory, the more popular version of which you may know as Thucydides' trap. You know, this is uh, US decline, China's rise, potential, you know, conflict, and all of this is kind of uh, pre-shocks of, of that. Uh, this is why we have all these conflicts uh, around the world. So I think uh, established international appro relations approaches, at least some of them would say, uh, yes, we are, we are in difficult times, but not unprecedented. And then we have some schools of thought. Here I have, you know, Adam Tooze, the economic historian, as an example, because I think uh, he uh, advances this argument most uh, forcefully. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, this idea that, yes, some of the conflicts and troubles we're facing are familiar, but the confluence of them, there are so many intersecting conflicts. Uh, including climate change, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the intersection of them is unprecedented. Uh, and there is no real historical parallel that we can turn to uh, to think about, you know, what is going on in the 21st century. Uh, and we need to be uh, okay with that. Uh, so, who is right? Is it that, you know, is it just back to old style uh, great power politics or is it an unprecedented time of poly crisis? Uh, I'm going to try to answer that question. Uh, I'm going to ki kind of come down in the middle. <laughs> I'm going to argue that uh, traditional IR is missing some of the picture, but at the same time, uh, if we take uh, a long enough view of history, there are actually uh, periods that we can look at, uh, but not identical, but in, uh, that will help us uh, make sense of uh, the 21st century. So in order to do that, first I'm going to talk to you about um, the argument in Before the West a little bit, and uh, here I'm cognizant of the fact that I've talked about my book uh, at McGill at least twice before I presented an epilogue, I think uh, in early in the book's journey, and I've appeared in uh, Professor Rush's localization uh, podcast, uh, talking about some of the same themes. But hopefully for those you know, uh, who haven't heard, it will be helpful, and for others it will be a refresher. And then I will talk about my current uh, British Academy project on uh, this order, which comes directly out of some of the historical arguments. Uh, I'm making in the book. So, uh, okay, so before the West uh, essentially has the ambition of expanding international relations historical imagination. 
because all of the uh, you know, great power decline, you know, crisis of the liberal international, all of those debates that we are having now uh, in international relations theory uh, rest on a particular uh, type of uh, history, particular understanding of history that you yourselves may have encountered, especially if you did international relations as an undergraduate. So that history is, uh, you know, starts usually in the, with the Peloponnesian War, you know, that's the uh, Thucydides trap stuff, and then jumps to 1648, uh, Peace of Westphalia, uh, and then we have a number of e e events uh, that are considered to be important for international relations theorizing, uh, you know, Congress of Vienna, Concert of Europe, lead up to World War I, World War II, end of the Cold War. We briefly included 9-11, but I don't think, you know, it quite made the canon. Um, anyway, so this is kind of the historical events that uh, undergraduate uh, students of internationalists get exposed to if they haven't done any other history work. Uh, and that creates the impression, I think, because, uh, because we don't talk about other time periods and we don't talk about other places. I mean, also, also this history is very much focused on, you know, Europe and the West, great powers are from there. Uh, there is this idea that nothing of importance must have happened nothing of importance to international relations theorizing must have happened anywhere else in the world or at any other time before 1648 except the Peloponnesian War. Uh, and if you study, uh, you know, order making uh, in international relations, uh, let's say, you know, you want to talk about the liberal international order, what are some of the historical examples you can think with, Again, this history uh, that we're operating with is quite limiting because it's also this story of no order, nothing, 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 and then there is regional order <laughs> in Europe in, in the 17th century, and that gets exported to the rest of the world. Uh, the, the rest of the world gets connected for the first time by European actors. Uh, so that, that is kind of the assumption that we find in mainstream IR, but also critical versions of international relations often have the same take. Uh, they are just unhappy about this history, right? They, they still think uh, it came, you know, from, uh, from Europe. Um, and that creates the impression, again, because we don't talk about the other parts of the world that much, that creates the impression that the rest of the world, until European actors came, were in their regional silos, uh, or civilizational silos, or religious silos. Again, the, the silos are often defined in uh, Eurocentric terms as well. And, uh, you know, the historical precursors of uh, India, I'm sorry, I don't know why India is so small. I don't mean to imply anything about the, about the font size. It, it's not supposed to be that way. Uh, China, India, Turkey, these countries, you know, they've always existed. They were disconnected. And the modern international order that came and connected them uh, is, I think, the operating assumption that we have. So what I tried to do in Before the West is to challenge these unstated, often unstated assumptions uh, that we have about international relations, its history, its or the order making, about the other parts of the world with a focus on Asia, Eurasia. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to tell a story of uh, world order construction that doesn't center Europe uh, in its accounts. In order to do that, I went to 13th century. I start in the 13th century. Now, <coughs> Because I've given this talk a bunch of times, I know somebody will ask, what about this other place in this other, uh, you know, previous uh, period? And yes, I don't mean to imply all order making starts in the 13th century. I am expanding uh, IR's imagination. Uh, I am not trying to supplant <laughs> one, you know, origin story with another. This is just 
expansion, not a claim of uh, you know the beginning, claim about the beginning of stuff. There's always more uh, history to be recovered. Uh, so I start with the what's called the Mongol Empire or the Empire of Genghis Khan in uh, 13th century, because uh, it's a moment of convergence for the space that we call Asia today. Uh, in the same, you know, where much of the uh, the, sp the territory and main, the peoples that live in this space came under the same ruler. So it's a moment of convergence for Asia that's similar to ro what Roman Empire was for uh, Europe uh, and the Mediterranean. Uh, th this is where fates converge, so it's a good place to start uh, the uh, you know, history of international relations uh, in Asia, Eurasia, one of the good places, not the only place. And what I'm arguing in the book is that this empire created uh, a world order that actually went beyond uh, you know, the, the boundaries or the frontiers of the empire. It ordered the world. It had all these knock-on effects even in spaces that uh, were not controlled by the uh, Chinggisids. Uh, and how do we know it, this was an ordered world? I mean, one, you know, I, I discuss ex other examples, but one way we know is uh, through the accounts of travelers. Uh, so, you know, you will know uh, Marco Polo, uh, who's traveling in the space at this time. And, you know, there's this idea of Marco Polo in the popular imagination as if he was an astronaut going into space, a place as nobody had ever been. But in reality, his, the ease of his travel is facilitated by the fact that this is an ordered world where there's a lot of uh, pre-established commonality uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, trade routes, travel routes, understandings, uh, connections, etc. And he was not the only traveler. I discuss another one a lot later. Uh, um, Ibn Battuta, uh, less familiar to uh, most readers, but he also was somebody who started his life uh, in Western North Africa. Uh, and then traveled across Asia for decades, finding gainful employment, and then went back to his hometown, wrote his memoirs. And when you read his memoirs, you see nobody is ever like shocked to receive him. They they know where he's coming from, and they ask for updates from the other uh, towns that he's been to. Is always you know his social credit uh, uh, always transfers. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it shows, the memoirs I think clearly show, again, this is just an, another example, uh, an ordered connected world. Uh, I mean, in the book I discuss, you know, what makes, uh, like, my life story possible. Like, I, I grew up in Turkey, I went to the US, I went, and then I went to uh, the UK, uh, and, uh, you know, what makes that possible is the fact that we live in a, uh, globalized, connected, ordered world. Uh, and uh, 13th, 14th century Asia uh, was similar uh, in terms of its connections. So world orders of this sort uh, create uh, convergences uh, around certain uh, shared uh, things like materials and goods uh, and institutions and norms. Uh, and a good example uh, of the types of <laughs> goods and materials that are shared is the dumpling, uh, as exemplified by this map. That's not my map. But uh, so the, the Mongol or the Chinggisid world order in the 13th, 14th century among other things, disseminated the dumpling. It has different names in uh, different places. I don't know who invented it, but it disseminated thanks to this world order. Uh, but of course, uh, from a political science perspective, or international relations perspective, 
even more interesting are the dissemination of institutions, norms, and ideas that shape the way people relate to the world. That's another way this world order uh, operated. So what I'm doing in the book is to argue uh, that a particular understanding of sovereignty, uh, again, a term we associate with European political trajectory, but one of the moves I'm making is to expand the definition of that concept. And I say a particular understanding of sovereignty, which I call Chinggis sovereignty after Genghis Khan, not because he necessarily invented it, but it became associated with his person after, after this moment. Uh, disseminated across this space that was ordered by uh, this first world order. I'm not first, in the time period I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, that uh, sovereignty model, that particular understanding of sovereignty, which was characterized by extreme centralization of authority in the person of the ruler and legitimated by world empire. So, the ruler is like a god, and he gets to be so because he's a world conqueror. It's a bit tautological, but that's the legitimation uh, model. This is, this is the primary institution we can see uh, ordering the world in the space for centuries after. Uh, and a number of secondary institutions that attach to that model. So I argue that, uh, you know, uh, that there were these world orders organized by this sovereignty principle uh, in Asia from at least uh, the 13th century to the 17th. Uh, it's a world order not of nation states but great houses uh, and uh, they are not identical to our world orders but to some extent comparable to the modern international order. Uh, in some ways that I will discuss in a moment. So um, the book looks at three successive world orders organized by these principles. The first one I've already mentioned, the Genghisid world order, uh, which starts with the world empire of Genghis Khan and then fragments into four pieces, uh, which have different names because of different national his, his, subsequent na national historiographies, but essentially were the same thing at that time. Uh, and you can see here uh, that is much of Asia, with the exception of uh, the parts of the modern day Middle East, uh, the Indian subcontinent, and Southeast Asia, although they did you know, expand uh, a bit into the islands. But even places, as I discuss in the, in the book, even places not under direct control were very much ordered by these principles. Uh, then that order uh, makes way for a second order that I discuss again. Uh, so this is the, the uh, mid-14th uh, to 15th century order. Um, dominated by two great houses, the Timurids and the Ming Dynasty, who are again influenced by uh, the same uh, sovereignty model, uh, same understanding. Uh, the early Ming, later the Ming move away from this, but the early Ming are very much, even though they have rebelled against the Yuan, they are very much actually shaped by uh, the, the, that period, and this is almost like a bipolar order, or like similar to uh, the Cold War or order uh, of our <laughs> of modernity. Uh, two rivals, seemingly very different, but actually uh, they have a, they have a lot that they share in terms of how they see the world. And then a third world order with. Uh, uh, the Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughals, uh, the, these three great houses uh, at its core that's expanding from uh, West Asia uh, in the 16th century uh, and then a number of other houses outside of that core uh, that, like the Habsburgs, Moscow, uh, 
and parts of Asia that are also influenced by the same sovereignty norms. I don't want to get uh, into it too much uh, because I want to actually talk about disorder. I'm happy to answer questions uh, in the Q&A if people have <laughs> objections, for instance, to the claim that I'm making that the Habsburgs were influenced by this, uh, but I stand by it, uh, so I'll move on and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get back to it. So what I'm finding in all successive world orders, uh, as I said, is this under particular understanding of sovereignty, particular approach to order building uh, that's characterized by centralization, the claims of universal sovereignty, uh, the idea, the elevation of political authority over the religious. Uh, so law comes from political rule. Uh, world conquest as a uh, legitimation tool, so this external uh, reach uh, we see in all of these houses, and a number of secondary institutions, as I said, that seem to go with this package, uh, an interest in astrology, astronomy, uh, sponsorship of, for instance, observatories, Tanistry, which is a um, succession model that uh, involves fighting male members of your family, uh, hunting gar gardens. Uh, again, we can talk about the reasons why. Um, cultural pluralism, because the ruling house is so above the people who are ruled, they don't care very much what the regular people are up to. Uh, so they tend to be more culturally pluralist, these orders and uh, an interest in facilitation of trade. Of course, it changes over time, intermixes with other local practices, but this, this package you can see, just as you know, the nation state norm has changed over time in its practice, but you can see the core package uh, across these different uh, orders. So this allows me and this allowed me in the book, um, the, the schema, I mean, the, the <laughs> representation is a bit convoluted, but you'll get uh, what I'm, uh, you'll see what I'm getting at. So I, I, I uh, complement, I mean, I both challenge and complement the traditional IR story of little Westphalian order becoming global <laughs> with, uh, uh, previous world orders, previous orders with world covering ambitions, universal ambitions, uh, that had uh, direct and indirect links on the Westphalian order and what came after. So that is, uh, that is the historical account of orders in the book. Uh, and of course you can put that history to any use uh, that you like, to the, to the extent that you agree with it. But uh, what I was thinking as I was writing the book, because I was also very immersed in these debates about you know, what's happening now, is it the, what's, where is the liberal international order going, I, I thought one way we can, you know, this history is helpful, uh, is it allows us to uh, treat decline as, uh, a level of analysis problem. International relations loves level of analysis <laughs> problems, and, but decline we haven't really treated as a level of analysis thing. We assumed uh, it's only great powers that rise and decline. Until very recently, it, it didn't occur to people that uh, international orders could themselves uh, decline because you know there was this teleological notion end of history stuff, uh, but. What I'm saying is, you know, if you look at the long durée, uh, you can see, yes, great powers rise and decline, but orders can also be replaced, and they don't have to be replaced with bigger, better, more refined versions of themselves. There might not be any normative continuity. And a third level I propose is this concept of ecumene, uh, which is the deep underlying, it's almost like civilization or ontology, like things people for, take for granted, they think that they will never change. Uh, uh, and those taken for granted, very deep-seated norms link successive orders. So we know, for instance, 
in our time, our current order is linked with 19th century uh, imperial, European imperial order, uh, even though it has changed, because there are some underlying assumptions we take for granted, the centrality of the West, this hierarchy between West and East, and that the West is at, at, at the top or something, or territoriality, you know, the idea of nation. We take these for, things for granted. We think they will never change. And in my Eastern world order, there were similar things that people took for granted, uh, the significance of you know, China, Genghis at charisma, all sorts of things that people completely ordered their world, unquestionable, but uh, they went away. So that's another level of decline. So international relations has not worried enough about order decline or, or ecumenical change. Now, the book, of course, makes a very strong argument for seeing orders where we thought they didn't exist for international relations scholars. Uh, but in writing it, I became interested in the question of uh, how did these orders end? Uh, so almost seamlessly moved into studying uh, disorder, uh, even though disorder is a concept that's not often defined or actually quite difficult to define if you think about it too much. Uh, but <laughs> the British Academy has given me some money to think about this, uh, uh, to bring together uh, historians uh, and international relations scholars uh, to think about uh, disorder. And what I proposed to get that grant, and this comes out of the book, is to look at uh, periods that, uh, that people think of disordered periods, and to see if they, if they seem similar or they have anything to offer uh, uh, us uh, about you know, how to think about the present. So, of course, the traditional likely candidates are 19th century and 20th century. International relations, when it thinks about the present, what is happening, disorder to the extent that, you know, it looks at history at all, you know, the interwar period or again, early part of the 19th century. This is different for historians, I realize, but for international relations, these would be periods to look at for, as a potential uh, analog to uh, the present. Uh, but in my grant application, I put the 17th century. And that is because uh, of the book, what I've just described to you now in very br uh, brief outline. And uh, here I want to make the case that the 17th century is actually a much better precedent for uh, the 21st century uh, if you buy my story of these previous Eastern world orders. Now, I've told you already that I argue that there were th uh, at least three world orders uh, uh, between th uh, 13th and 17th century. And, you know, the world orders that I look at, they didn't come to an end because of uh, great power or great house rivalry, uh, but they, they kind of fragmented uh, because of uh, other, other problems. Uh, so there are periods that punctuate my world, or, uh, world orders, uh, periods that some historians at least call crisis periods. So there is a mid 14th century crisis, uh, well, 14th century crisis, mid 15th century crisis, and more famously, uh, what is sometimes called the general crisis of the 17th century. Uh, this is, uh, this got my attention, I started thinking about it. And it does seem that, uh, you know, structural pressures, uh, crises under, uh, written by structural uh, pressures seem to play an or a role in fragmenting orders. Uh, I have my own definition of structural, uh, beyond the control of human agency, let's say, I mean, the, uh, which changes over time. Human agency is not constant. Um, so 14th century, you have you know, Black Death, banking crises in Europe. Um, there's a, a cooling climate pocket, uh, mid 15th century, again, similarly, there's a climate anomaly, uh, there are famines, there's a contraction of 
precious metals, which the supply of precious metals, which really uh, disrupts overland trade with uh, horrible uh, effects, especially on West Asia, which is very reliant on trade with uh, East Asia. Uh, and then, you know, again, general crisis of the 17th century, which interestingly, so 14th century and mid 15th century, a couple decades of troubles. Uh, but then order is restored, there is a degree of normative continuity. Chinggisid norms survive. The general crisis of the 17th century, which by the way, it's like the general crisis of the 17th century as a concept has been around and has been challenged for almost a century now. Uh, and it used to be a concept used for European history because European history, as you know, very tumultuous in the 17th century. The English Civil War, you know, the Thirty Years' War, leading to Westphalian peace. Uh, now, uh, historians think it was actually a global, or at least northern hemispheric, uh, kind of situation. Again, there's a lot of debate, you know, is there really a general crisis? What we do know is that there's a period from the end of the 16th century to the last quarter of the 17th century where there are lots of wars, conflicts, rebellions, uh, population collapse, uh, you know, famines, crop shortage, all sorts of things. Again, there are different explanations have been flouted. Uh, it used to be that people blamed economics, uh, you know, um, inflation and so on. Now the favored explanation is climate. Uh, so here, I mean, you have the uh, time of troubles in Russia, uh, you have the Jelali rebellions in uh, Ottoman Empire, you have dynastic rebellions and then dynastic change in China. Uh, not everywhere, I mean, the Indian subcontinent is relatively shielded from these, uh, but at, at, at enough places, right? And in the book I dis discuss this, uh, I don't, you know, come down on one side, or, like, this is why it happened. But for me, what is interesting is, whatever was happening, it was enough to turn the major uh, powers uh, of the era, I mean, to use slightly anachronistic language, inwards. Everybody was kind of dealing with their own uh, stuff. And, I think, again, I think more research is needed on this, but uh, my sense is that both uh, competition and cooperation reinforces the existing order. What is really deadly for orders, what really creates disorder is uh, disengagement. So turning inwards is uh, what's uh, troubling uh, what causes disorder. So, of course, there's disorder because of the structural crisis, but in, at the level of institutions, norms, and so on, what, what is bad for them is uh, nobody reinforcing them, either through cooperation or conflict. Uh, so here is the, the climate explanation for what is happening, like, you know, for those who favor the climate explanations uh, for these crises. Uh, here's a um, little chart that illustrates this perhaps. Uh, there's this period from uh, the 13th century to the 19th century to the Industrial Revolution that is called the Little Ice Age, and the 17th century is the, its coolest period in the Northern Hemisphere, two to three degrees Celsius cooler and with unpredictable weather events and so on, which is again, of course, disruptive uh, of trade. And here's an illustration, uh, European paintings of that period, <laughs> featuring a lot of ice skating, which you probably haven't uh, <laughs> thought about much, but it, uh, it does seem to correspond. Uh, but of course, it's not just uh, structural crises that uh, undermine orders. Uh, and the other par part of the story, I'm thinking, is that uh, you know there, each order has its own uh, mode of legitimation. And here, this goes to some of my work on also the, the crisis of the liberal international order. Uh, each order has its own mode of legitimation. 
you know, for our order, it's liberalism, the promises of equality, equal treatment, etc. Uh, for Chinggisid orders that I look at in the book, it was conquest, you know, world conquest uh, is, was the primary mode of legitimation. It needed to be sometimes compromised, you know, it become, became hybridized as the rulers converted to Islam and other uh, local religions, but that was always at the core, uh, the promise. So for, if conquest stops for whatever reason, they ran into trouble. Uh, even if economics, otherwise everything worked, <laughs> uh, absence of conquest meant decline in, 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 this, in their mode. So uh, a good example is Pax Mongolica. You know, after the empire uh, breaks into four, at first they fight each other, but they cannot conquer each other, and then they settle into this coexistence, which is good for trade and all sorts of other things. Uh, but you cannot have four world empires. So it's a contradiction in terms. It's just like, you know, liberalism is always uh, creating its own uh, contradictions. And over time, you know, that uh, undermines, uh, undermines the legitimacy of the operating principle. Uh, I think when when the two happen at the same time, you know, if you have sustained uh, periods of structural crisis coupled with legitimation crises, which happen often regardless of structural pressures because no, no order is, can be uh, in, uh, completely internally consistent and deliver on its promises, uh, that, is, that, is a, that is when we run into real uh, disorder. And again, I suspect, uh, and this is like research underway, but uh, short periods of disorder, like the interwar period or the mid 15th century crisis, uh, allow norms and institutions to survive so that they are uh, repurposed in the next order in recognizable ways. But if you have long periods of disorder, structural crisis, uh, along with legitimation crises, uh, then you may have an ecumenical shift, like what happened in the 17th century, the world, world center shifting from east to west and different ways of understanding sovereignty and different institutions. So what I'm suggesting to you today, again, these are some preliminary ideas, but that the 21st century uh, may be like the 17th century, we may be actually in for decades of uh, disorder, which may result with not just power transition or the crisis of the liberal international order, but something bigger, some kind of uh, what I'm calling ecumenical shift in the way we understand sovereignty, in the way we understand uh, order building, uh, in the way we uh, live our lives uh, because some of the same factors like climate change, economics, all that, and you know, political agency, of course, uh, are also present in our time. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can say. Wow. So much to think about. Thank you so much. Um, so we are now going to open the floor to question and answer. If you can, if people have questions, if you can just go to the microphones um, and perhaps just introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you. So I start. Uh, hi, right. Lawrence Lutti. I mean, you yes. know each other, right? Yes. Uh, you know that we are on the same side on, on, in this debate, right? I mean, but I want to push a little bit back, right? Sure. Uh, you made the argument in, for Genghis Khan that this is a centralized empire and that centralization, I mean, you suggest that centralization might be the key actually for these orders. Now, 
I have started actually Yuan, China and the Mongol Empire way, way back in grad school, so <laughs> 30 years ago. This is how old I am. And one of the arguments is that the reason why it collapsed is because it was not actually centralized. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is it centralization or is it maybe something else that is relevant? Standardization of norms and laws, for example, uh, because the four successor uh, empires were stable because they subscribed to the same actually standards and norms. And this would also apply to the liberal uh, order. We don't need, I mean, the, the international liberal order after 1945, we don't need uh, somebody to enforce it, right? Uh, it was actually polycentral in many respects, but it is subscribed to, uh, to, to shared actually standards, norms of behavior and, and ideas, right? So, Political centralization might not be actually the explanation here. And that then would also sort of go into this direction. Is the collapse actually of the current order one actually of standards? China, you know, is a rising power. Is China challenging actually the liberal international order? Or is Russia actually challenging it right now with the war against Ukraine, right? So uh, I don't think so. China is actually a challenger to the liberal order, right? It actually wants to preserve it. So uh, this might then actually change the trajectory of your explanation into the future. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, it's centralization of authority, centralization and elevation of political authority. Uh, in practice, uh, I don't think it was that centralized because it couldn't be. I mean, in, in fact, I have a typology in the book, you know, about like homogenization of society, etc. But uh, I suspect, uh, you know, sovereignty models of this type where all authority rests with the ruler in principle, in practice, they look quite decentralized uh, because it, you know, a person cannot check everything. Uh, so what I'm talking about is, is the idea that this is how politics should be organized rather than what, it is, what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, uh, like, you know, it, in the, you know, actually practices varied quite a bit from the Middle East to China. Um, and, you know, David Sneath, who I cite in the book, has this book called Headless State, and he's, he's, he argues that Inner Asia, you know, he's an anthropologist of in, Inner Central Asia, and he, he says, uh, even at, at times where there is no centralization, uh, there's quite uh, functional stuff, uh, you know, be, because these are, uh, relatively aristocratic net network societies, contrary to what people think. But I would, you know, extend that argument and say it's because uh, in very centralized models, the day-to-day -day life looks very much like decentralization. Uh, I mean, it's true now, like, uh, like a lot of things work in Turkey, not because like Erdogan is micromanaging everything, but, but you know there's a there's kind of an ease to like doing stuff without you know you're under the watchful eye of the center in a way, but every day you know you're kind of self-regulating. Um, yeah, but I, going to your uh, second uh, second question about standards and institutions. I mean, I, I think I, I am also getting at that. I mean, so what this type of political organization does uh, is uh, orient those that are exposed to it towards shared understandings and standards. So even if there isn't full like homogenization or like complete everyday standardization of rules, uh, it creates much more common ground in a way uh, than would be uh, would be had it did it, had it not exist. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm Colin Chia. I'm a uh, faculty lecturer in the Department of Political Science. Um, so I'm really uh, you know, like interested in uh, and have actually encountered your work as you know part of my research when I you know, wrote about like uh, historical orders in Southeast Asia. Um, and so just, to, and so I was actually very interested in your idea of, in particular of 
the importance of legitimation mm -hmm. and this kind of ecumenical shift. Um, but I'm also wondering about how, you know, if you could talk a bit more, number one, talk a bit more about how, like, legitimation and the, how that might be affected by the ecumenical shift and therefore actually maybe contribute further to disorder because precisely because that undermines the existing understandings of legitimacy or proliferates different understandings of legitimacy, therefore making some actors less willing to follow you know, leaders or hegemons or whatever that might be. And I think the second part, part is that actually, that seems a bit counterintuitive, and maybe you can talk about this, because the more that there is this kind of structural disorder or the more that there's some kind of polycrisis, right, wouldn't that also in, maybe have the opposite effect of making actors more uh, wedded to existing mm. ecumenical or yeah. idea, structuring ideas which they can cling to because that is, a, that is the order that they can cling to in the face of increasing yes. like outsider disorders. So I wonder if you, what you think about it. Yeah, actually that, that did happen. Uh, so uh, yeah, in the, in, the, in the 17th century, uh, and actually Jack Goldstone has a, um, an article about this that's, you know, several decades old now, but I think the argument is relevant here. So he compares uh, England, the Ottoman Empire, and Ming China, uh, and having their own you know, versions of <laughs> crisis around the same time, uh, which is actually the, uh, in the larger context of the 17th century general crisis. And both in the Ottomans and the Ming, there is a turn uh, to the past because uh, things have worked for them. So they, they want to hold on to what has worked. Uh, and his, uh, Goldstone's argument is the English didn't have such, such a period to look back at, so they were more innovative and they, you know. Uh, so I think that is, that is happening. I mean, in fact, you know, the Ottomans from uh, the end of the 16th century and during these rebellions, there's a lot of literature about like, we are declining, you know, because we've stopped conquering. <laughs> I mean, again, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, there's decline, decline, decline. We're so like worried about decline, uh, and again, there's a desire to go back to what they think worked, the older legitimation modes, uh, and then they managed to recover <laughs> from the crisis, even without dynastic change. You know, the Ottoman Empire is one place; dynastic change doesn't happen. Uh, and then, like in the 19th century, like some of those decline uh, discourses are rediscovered uh, because they, there's another decline this time in the face of you know Euro uh, European uh, advancement. Uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I'm 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 digressing, but yeah. So it, it does it does it does happen that structural crisis creates uh, this desire to uh, return back to something that you lost, uh, which arguably is what is happening now with like the West. Like the West is much more attached to what is called the liberal international order, like saving it, salvaging it, ending the crisis. The rest of the world is much less bothered uh, about what is happening. Uh, there is much less talk about crisis or disorder apart from maybe like climate change or some of the bigger things. Uh, so I think in these periods of uh, prolonged disorder, actually having done well before is a, almost a disadvantage because it's, uh, it uh, creates an attachment uh, to uh, the previous periods when you should be adapting uh, and finding new ways of dealing with uh, new realities. Uh, the ecumenical shift, sorry, I keep going on. It's not just the disorder that causes ecumenical shift. I think these are like long sociological processes that are underway, but the period of disorder, I think, allows new forms, new arrangements uh, to, uh, yeah, to take, take over. You know, they're already there. It's not like they are necessarily invented during periods of disorder, but they, they, they are given uh, more of a chance had there not be uh, disorder. Yeah, being disorder. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm a first year management student. Um, I was wondering, you said 
Um, well, two questions, probably cheating, but um, so I guess my first and most important question is you said that you believe that a sustained period of disorder is coming, which kind of implies that you believe that an ecumenical shift uh, is also coming. <laughs> I said maybe, maybe. Okay. Well, um, we never speak in certainties. Okay. You know? Well, yes. yeah, but I think there's definitely a good reason to believe that that's going to happen. Um, but I think what you said kind of scared me because it implies a lot of uncertainty for, you know, the younger ones among us. Um, so, you know, this is maybe beyond uh, what you would be capable of you know, predicting, but do you have any predictions as to what you think that, I guess, change in the underlying assumptions mm. behind the world order um, could look like? And also, sh second but shorter question, um, I was thinking uh, you're talking about kind of this Chinggisid model. Um, do you think that um, maybe the uh, a Caymanid, earlier Caymanid empires would be like a, a, an example of this mm. that would have been you know, much yes. earlier? Thank you. Uh, two great questions, which also allow me to continue from the previous discussion. So, I mean, what are some of the possible changes? Uh, again, you know, uh, whatever changes are going to happen, there are the, the seeds of that are already probably present. It's not like there's going to be disorder, as I was saying, and suddenly people will come up with entirely new ways of doing things. Uh, so, but something that exists now but can't get a foothold in the way we order the world might uh, might find more of a foothold in a period of disorder so one, one example if we're talking about sovereignty models um, you know on the one hand what we're witnessing is uh, repersonalization of sovereignty in, in many places um, so, I mean, history of modernity is depersonalization of sovereignty. So getting away from the Chinggisid model to the state as such with its institutions. I mean, in Europe, it was never like that much person oriented anyway. But, uh, and what we're seeing now, one could argue, is, you know, you have like Erdogan's Turkey, Putin's Russia, like, you know, like it's, get, uh, to an extent we have repersonalized. And at the same time, uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's a complete process, but it's, it's a trend in that direction. Uh, at the same time, you have people, like individuals, being treated almost as if they were states, like Elon Musk, like <laughs> going to X place and getting like head of state treatment, like immediately, like uh, can meet whoever he wants. He has like weaponry, the satellite, you know. So it's like a person that is almost like a state. So those are, you know, 10 years ago we were talking about multinational corporations, company states, and so on. Now we're talking about pers like st uh, personalized states uh, and statified persons or whatever. So that that could be, you know, I don't know, like long enough that. Uh, uh, <laughs> disorder, and maybe that becomes the way we order, reorder the world, right? Like something that goes away from the uh, unpersonal, institutionalized state, nation state, and becomes much more, uh, like it would be uh, a comeback of that sort of, uh, sort of arrangement for a new time. Of course, it's never, it never repeats itself. It's always hybridized with like technology and so on. So that takes me to your second question. So Ahmed, it's, yeah, so I think what Genghis Khan did, as I said, he didn't invent this particular sovereignty model. It has, it's echoes in ancient, like in antiquity, there, there was much more of this, uh, a ruler as a lawgiver, almost a god. Uh, and then it goes, that model falls out of favor with uh, the advance of you know, monotheism and other transcendental belief systems, which puts a check on how much power a human can have, because the real power is, in, <laughs> is transcendental, like it's God or afterlife, you know, karma or something. And then, uh, so that, that's a check on one person having all that authority. Uh, it never fully goes away. I think in, in Inner Asia that <laughs> the idea that one person could have, they don't have, they're not uh, exposed as much to those belief systems. So from there it makes a comeback. And then 
it becomes a very strong argument for some centuries for centralizing, not in practice, but in theory, authority. Like somebody, like <laughs> a, a ruler that's uh, b bigger than God in a way, like if you think of Akbar, or so, like you know, like it's you know bigger than prophets, you know, it's like, and then that's that's injected into the European trajectory via the Habsburgs, who, you know, Charles, who tries to assert himself over the church and all of that. Uh, so nothing is in a way like uh, new under the sun, but at the same time, like these different way, ways of thinking about the relationship with religion, politics, individuals, like. Different combinations make comebacks in different time periods with new technologies and so on, to, uh, and new uh, methods of warfare and others. Yeah. Sorry. I, I love these topics, so I tend to digress, and I'm a little bit jet lagged, so you have to stop me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm TV Paul, yes. political science, McGill. So, uh, fantastic project. I really i am very impressed by this project. But my question is, where is agency in all this? Um, I could make an argument that it is how agents read structural forces and how to respond or to make use of those that produce order or disorder. It's not structure alone. You need a Metternich, you need a Woodrow Wilson, you need um, a Napoleon, you need uh, all kinds of characters in between who understand the structure in their own ways. Yeah. Right now, Mr. Trump versus whoever, you know. And uh, so I think the account won't be complete until you bring in agency, because agents can shift sometimes mm -hmm. how the structure is formulated, even after an intense war and crisis. You use that opportunity to create order. American constitution makers uh, after civil war. You know, yeah. A lot of things I can talk about. So that's what I'm, I, I worry that it will, will it be a, a structural account alone or are you going to no. go beyond that? Now, let me come <laughs> to the sec second question. Yes. Second question is rather problematic one because the more I read the Tianxia models or the Sinic centric models, your uh, picture of Asia Pacific of six, seven empires coexisting it seems rarely, it's not your problem, it rarely comes out in that Sinic world order accounts of the times. I'm curious to know why is that, that it is ruling the whole Sinologist world um, and the accounts, even the Chinese believe that they were the center of the world. I mean, maybe there is mm. a reason. These other empires coexisted and you show yes. that quite nicely. Yes. And <laughs> perhaps that could be a new project for you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, agency structure. I mean, it's interesting. So, uh, one of the things I say in the book is that I don't think these are like the relationship between agency and structure is not uh, like trans historically constant. Uh, I think there has been an increase of uh, in like both human agency uh, in modernity, but also distribution of such agency. So in the book, if you read it, I mean, even though I've given a very structural account, like in the chapters, I'm talking about specific people, uh, like specific rulers and so on, and some, you know, in intelligentsia and so on. So in that world, some people had a lot of agency and a lot of people had no agency. I mean, they were hardly differentiated uh, from uh, cattle. I mean, that doesn't mean, of course, everyday life. We don't really have like much primary records, but it, it's, these are societies, uh, the way they are organized, uh, make more powerful agents than of some. Uh, I guess that's Nietzsche's point too, like in Beyond Good and Evil, right? Like so, the, you know, the, some are real agents, like Genghis Khan is an agent, uh, but the people he's ruling over are much less agentic than the everyday people in modernity. So, uh, and then with, one of the things that is happening, uh, I think, so in, in the European trajectory, the distance between uh, the, the kings and the regular people always sh small, not always, at least in this time period I'm looking at, is smaller, uh, and that has particular effects on the, the sovereignty model that comes to take over after the 17th century. Uh, and uh, you know that's been 
how we've been organizing our world more or less since then. At least in theory, we say like everybody is an agent. It's not that some are agents and some are uh, nothing. Uh, again, expanding. In practice, not so much, but you know that's that's been kind of the trend. Uh, so if we have another change, like if we have another transition, just as the way we organize or understand sovereignty may change, the way we understand agency, who has it, who doesn't have it, would probably also change. Another like ecumenical shift, for instance, maybe like who are the agents? Uh, like a like we talk about AI, like you know. <laughs> Again, like that's almost something like like transcendental, like tr transcendental, like authority. It's almost like you take agency out of uh, people and out of rulers, maybe, and then you you say like AI decides. Like, is that an agent? Like, so, so the agency is definitely part of the story and the changes in which we understand who's an agent, who has rights, who has power, who has authority. Uh, yeah, the Tianxia model. Actually, in the book, I have like a long takedown of like the sinocentric stuff as well, uh, because one of the reasons why I wanted to write this account is I, because I don't want to replace Westphalia with some kind of sinocentric account. Uh, I also don't want to replace it with a Mongol-centric account, so I have a long epilogue like saying I, this is not what I'm doing. Uh, but yeah, so the you know the fair banks like the tributary model, like all of that, those are like modern uh, projects, super ba imposed back in time. They don't really hold up to you know how people who lived then understood. Uh, I mean, a good example is like uh, gifts from uh, the Timurids are coded as. I mean, that's not exactly on your point, but just illustrative. They're called it as tribute, but they were not sent as tribute, right? So <laughs> this no notion that, uh, you know, China was central and everybody accepted as such is, is a modern notion. Like, just as the, like, you know, Turks love the idea of the millet system. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, you know, like it's, uh, it's uh, the millet system that, of multicultural, it's it's the creation like of 19th century. You know, like it's it's in, if you look at historical records, it's much more complicated. Yeah. My name's my name's Eve Winter. I also teach in political science here at McGill. Um, I uh, thought your critique of IR in terms of its uh, failure to think historically was very plausible. Although one might say that it's also low-hanging fruit. <laughs> Um, well, we have to pick, in, pick the long hang, the hanging <laughs> fruit. <laughs> um, my, my worry uh, about your talk is that you, I'm wondering whether you're actually reproducing some of those problems mm. that you're, you're, you're criticizing. And so I, was, I wanted to um, ask you a little bit more about the, the mechanisms of change that you're uh, postulating here in terms of uh, between orders and, um, and, and, and acumens. Um, and again, I thought that your, your um, basic point that we need to think about orders as also declining, uh, have that level of analysis um, uh, perspective seems very plausible. But, um, but when I'm thinking about the mechanisms of change that you, that you suggest, um, we are basically talking about institutions and norms. And um, at various points you referred to climate, although it wasn't, wasn't clear to me how climate and generally more ecological questions would intersect with those institutions and norms. And then the, the big piece that was missing um, was how these various orders reproduce themselves economically. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to that, given that economic reproduction seems to be a basic condition for any order to maintain itself in place. And also, a form of ecological reproduction seems to be a condition. So I was wondering if you could speak to that and how these things articulate with the question of uh, institutions and norms that you've foregrounded in your talk. Thank you. Yes. Uh, when you said I'm reproducing problems that I'm critiquing, I thought you were going to go in a different direction. But it's, it's for sure that I'm reproducing some of the problems I'm critiquing. That's, like, that's inevitable. I admit that. Uh, I mean, that's uh, how. <laughs> how language works, but uh, you know, usually I get criticized for using the terms East and West. But so, so in case somebody's planning to ask that, that I thought that's where the question was <laughs> was going. But yeah, mechanisms of change. Yes, it's it's a bit underspecified. I mean, in in the book, I'm interested in like again 
painting a picture of order where people didn't think there was any. Uh, so I worried a little bit less about like how do these orders end. But uh, as I said, I mean, I think what is happening, and climate change is a factor as a result of this, like some kind of structural pressure, whether it's climate change or financial or, you know, like coin shortage or something, uh, is disrupting the connections uh, between uh, the uh, political actors. Uh, so any kind of connection, like so, it could be even uh, conflict. You know, they're not fighting each other; they're like trying to suppress rebellions. Uh, they're not trading. I mean, that this goes to the economic. Sorry, where? where did, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, there should be more uh, economics in the book. I, there is more. I mean, there is more than I've said, because just writing this, I became convinced. Oh, it's like such a big part of the story, like uh, trade routes and all of that. So uh, it's disrupting trade. Uh, it's disrupting all sorts of things. And the lack of engagement is my uh, mechanism for why order, not even declines, kind of like phrase. Uh, so the, some of the institutions' norms, like they, they are there. They don't completely disappear. So like, the idea of Qing is it's being so important. It's like there in the 19th century. I mean, there's still people trying to marry, like claim like marriage connections and so on. It's just not being reinforced as an ordering uh, principle. So that reinforcement requires people who believe in that notion, take it for granted, and are engaging with each other, competing with each other, or uh, trading with each other. I mean, the overland trade, like the so. One of the things that's happening in 17th century, overland trade, which used to be, which is such a important for the orders I'm talking about, from like East Asia to West Asia, it's long, but it's for centuries it makes a, long, a lot of sense because these are relatively safe, protected routes because this, this is an ordered world, uh, and. Uh, because of, partly because of, I think, climate change, because the weather patterns are so unpredictable, but partly because of political turmoil in the same period, what used to be very safe, predictable routes become uh, very risky. And that allows uh, for like, the maritime advantage, like, uh, like uh, shipping, I mean, which exists before, but always a much more risky, risky venture. Uh, for which, because of which like Europeans had developed various tools like insurance and so on to deal with those risks, which Asians for the most part don't have, uh, that suddenly has like an advantage over like overland trade. So economics is a huge part of the story and I touch on it, there should be more, but uh, and like also slave trade is a huge part of the story and so much so that I then like went and wrote uh, with a colleague uh, a paper which came out on ASPSR about like slavery and how Im important it was to actually state building and order making, not just in the Atlantic that we're familiar with, but actually in these previous uh, eras. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, hi, my name is Selena Kai, and I'm a fourth year student of history, political science, and classical studies at McGill University. Um, my question is based on your discussion on combinations and combats, and that is, is there a pat um, do you believe that there is a pattern behavior of international disorder that supplants the rise and fall of empire? Is there a more, if, is there a route of combinations that makes it effective in transitions towards decentralization, especially in areas that you've suggested may think of themselves less as nations or even as sovereigns and might have other um, assumptions of how to cohere a nation to, or cohere a region or an empire together? So uh, let, let me uh, ask you to clarify. So are you saying there is there a pattern to de decline? No. Say it again. Is it's a little bit fast for me. So yes. Of course. Is there a pattern behavior of disorder and elements that huh. contribute to pattern disorder that okay. may contribute to patterns in rising and falling empires? Yeah. That almost suggests something like a uh, Caldunian take, like, you know, they're <laughs> the settled and the nomads. Um, yeah, I mean, 
It's an interesting question. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I mean, my gut feeling is, you know, I mean, I try to be very histori histor his sensitive to historical change in my work, but in my heart of hearts, uh, you know, I'm a trained political scientist, so I almost also want to see, like, patterns and like recurring elements and so on. So. I mean, there, th things change, but then, there, as I said, there are certain packages that uh, are tried over and over. Like, like so, for instance, like revolution. There are only so many ways. Like, it it goes. It doesn't mean there are like two ways, but you can kind of maybe chart out possible universe of ways. And uh, probably there is also to centralization and decentralization. Uh, an order and disorder. Uh, I mean, I don't know what they are. I haven't, you know, typologized that yet. Maybe one day <laughs> I will. Uh, I will just uh, say that and then add with a note of caution. I mean, so the, the reason why I said the concept of disorder is a hard one is things like it's disorder always presumes, I think, a, a definition of order. Uh, and not everybody has the same like understanding definition of order. So things that may look like very disorderly actually may be quite orderly for to the participants because that's what they know, that's what they expect. Like uh, I don't know, like like traffic patterns, let's say. Uh, in Istanbul or something like it may look, you know, but uh, uh, or like again, as you know, an example is tennistry, which I mentioned. You know, like you fight like your brothers and uncles like to claim the throne. Like if you're used to like the eldest son inherits the throne model, that's very like it seems like disorderly. Why are they having like years of interregnum? But that that their model is selecting for the best conqueror. So like <laughs> that's that's a good way to ensure the person. Has problem, has no problem conquering anybody. Like this, this is the way you ensure it. Like if you can kill your relatives, you, you'll probably be a good conqueror. It makes sense. Like if that's what uh, what what you're looking for. So, we again, like I think there are probably recurring patterns, but we shouldn't operate with one understanding of order. Um, hello, um, Devish Riyavasti. I'm from the Department of Political Science. Um, so, regarding what you've mentioned about disorder, mm -hmm. there seemed what I could infer from your talk was that there's this pattern, there's a periodicity to all of this crisis, and these uh, this happened in the Bronze Age, then the 14th century, late 14th century uh, crisis, then the 17th century the general crisis theory in general. So uh, what would you attribute to this, all this chaos that happens, the flashpoints that just leads to, to mm. everything changing? Do you have a theory or a conjecture about it? Uh, yeah, I mean, another good question. I mean, the thing is, like, structural crises are probably, like, you know, like climate patterns or things like those are changing all the time. I think they become crises when the world becomes uh, like relatively ordered and connected. So, um, I mean, again, like this is like, this is still something I'm working on. But yeah, you said the Bronze Age collapse. Like before that, like it's it's a very connected, almost like again globalized. I mean, it's not global is not the right word, but it's like a connect, very connected Mediterranean. You know? Huh? Yeah. So, so uh, yes. Sorry, did you? That's what I'm saying, yeah. So it's the previous connection uh, and the interaction density or whatever that makes, whatever is happening, uh, a crisis. Uh, you wouldn't, like, if you were just like, uh, I mean, or like, because then you're not just affected by like what's happening to you lo locally, but you like rely on these other connections, like this trade, etc. So like what's happening over there is a problem. Uh, right, so uh, you know the mid 15th century, uh, like coin shortage, partly because there's a, there's not enough uh, precious metals, partly because like you know the Ming stop like uh, minting stop, minting coins. Again, we don't really know the reasons why, but for you know s suddenly you cannot 
you cannot trade, and it's a huge problem for all these Western uh, Asian dynasties that rely on it, and you have like dynastic change all over West Asia. Uh, and again, I can't show a uh, mechanism for change, like this is A then B, but s clearly like being in a connected system uh, has made, has increased their vulnerability to whatever is happening at a, a larger scale. Um, but yeah, great question. I mean, this, this is something really worth thinking about. Are okay. we out of time? So yes, we are, we are basically, <laughs> yes. we have like, two, you know, two minutes left before okay. everything. But uh, I want to say, I think this is just such a generative talk. Uh, it's obviously on cutting edge research. Um, I think it, it, we're all going to go away asking so many questions about like, what is order and disorder? <laughs> what is this dichotomy presupposing? What are the conceptions of order? Who is disorder? So again, the perspectival question of, of power, um, I think, comes into it, the different uh, ways that we can think about it. Also, as you know, my, my own interest in, in this uh, from the special issue that we published in International Affairs, I'm interested in like the normative upshot of disorder. So sometimes it can be also morally productive, I think, uh, for certain hegemonic or dominating orders to be, uh, to experience some disorder as well, right? So I, I'm, yeah, as you know, we're, we were having this conversation about this as well. So, but uh, please, um, before we uh, thank uh, Aisha for this incredible talk, I would also like to thank the people who make the Lynn Center's work possible. Uh, obviously, thank you very much to all of the participants of the research groups who come steadily to our events and also to this annual lecture. But there's a lot of organization that goes into these as well, so I would really like to thank the Lynn Center coordinator, the administrative coordinator, Jean-Félix Caron, who is sitting there in the back. He makes sure that there will be There will be food at, at the reception and uh, various things like that. Also, we did benefit from the uh, work of two research assistants uh, until now, uh, Nada and, and Grace, who are, I think, um, not sure they're here. Um, also, I would like to thank uh, Judith for coming to uh, do the photography for this event, as well as some others. And also to the film crew here, um, Jamie and, and John, for recording this so that it will be on the Lynn Center website uh, in a few days. Um, you'll be able to to uh, see this lecture on YouTube. And, um, and yeah, and now it's, it's time to, to thank Aisha Zarekul for sharing her research with us. Um, if you haven't read the book, uh, I highly recommend it. Um, there are copies, I believe, at Paragraph Bookstore. Um, and, um, but thank you very much for coming and sharing your ideas. Uh, it's very stimulating. And all of us will have to think about these problems, I think, uh, in this decade uh, ahead of us. And I think it's all, we're all benefiting from the fact that, that you are helping us to think about them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.